the God who sometimes sees fit to try us, is the same God who entered into the drama in the worst of trials in the person of his son, the God who suffered as a man for us, suffered profoundly and in our place as the man Jesus Christ. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today we continue a message we began last time, the Lord who provides. And uh, Jonathan, as we face the trials and the struggles and the pain of our lives, how does looking to Jesus help us in the midst of that? Well, I think it helps us on all kinds of different levels. But there is, there is something fundamentally deeply encouraging about looking to one who has suffered the worst of trials imaginable at the cross, looking to one ascended to heaven on high, there is our great high priest, who knows what it is to suffer as a human being and who has plumbed the depths of that suffering at the cross and who has done so for us. There is, there is a deep understanding in the heart and mind of Jesus Christ when it comes to the experience of human suffering. And so as we suffer, I think there's a, a great comfort to be able to, in a sense, take those trials to him, to take them to the cross, knowing that he can relate, if, if you will. In fact, he's experienced a suffering far greater than ours. Well, that's right. When we go to him in our suffering, in our grief, and our pain, he understands as one who became human and entered into human suffering. But more than that, he is also able to help because he is the Lord of heaven above at the same time. Yeah. And so we come to one who understands, one who cares, and one who is able to help because he is all-powerful as well. And so there is great comfort in trial in looking to Jesus Christ. And, and there will be those listening today, I know, who are in the midst of suffering and trial. And let me encourage you, the one place to go is to Jesus Christ, who is more than able and more than willing to meet you in your need, if you will, but come to him. Well, today we're going to continue to look at this truth from Genesis 22 as we continue a message called The Lord Who Provides. Here is Jonathan. So what did Abraham reason by faith when God called upon him to sacrifice Isaac? Here's what he reasoned. He reasoned that God must be planning to bring him back from the dead because there was no way that Isaac could die and stay dead and the promise of God be fulfilled in accordance with his word. And anyway, he reasoned, the sovereign God is more than able to overcome the grave. And so here is the great insight. Here is what Hebrews sees that I did not see. When Abraham says to the guys, look, Isaac and I, we're going up the mountain for a bit. We're going to go worship. We're taking a hike. But don't worry. We're going to be back soon. Abraham was actually not fibbing. He wasn't kind of manipulating or massaging the truth. He was making a declaration of faith in verse 5. Faith in the covenant promises of God. Faith in the life-giving power of God. He had no idea, I guess, why God was allowing him to go through this trial. He had no idea exactly how all this was going to play out, but he believed the covenant promise. He didn't know the details, but he knew the big picture. And here is the moment where I think you and I draw a lesson from Abraham, and we see how his model speaks to our heart and our life in trial. You see, if you and I belong to Jesus Christ by faith— we have in our hand and in our heart the covenant promises of God. We know the outcome of the story because we have it in God's Word written for us. We, we don't know the details of how our particular trial will end or how our crisis will be resolved, but we know this, God will save His people in the end. We know that He's going to make us like His Son. We know that death can never be the end of the story for us. We know that God has resurrection power. We know that he's going to take us home. 
We know that we have a secure future in a new heaven and a new earth. And so we can walk through trial and we can stand up under testing because we know that the promises of God simply cannot fail. Now, right there, in that, there is powerful fuel for faith in the face of trial. Just think of it. If God will keep all His promises to me, if death is no barrier to Him, if my future is secure, then what trial is actually going to be enough to sink my faith? What test can truly unsettle me? That's what Abraham knew, and that's what Abraham believed. That's why he put one foot in front of the other and made his way to that fearful mountain. I think I was tempted to see in Abraham's next words another little skirting of the truth, another little fib, but I've thought better of that now. I'm learning my lesson. Just notice with me what happens next. Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain. Isaac carrying the wood of the sacrifice, verse 6. Abraham carrying the fire and the knife. Isaac rather innocently asks the obvious question in verse 7, second half of the verse. Behold, the, the, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That's an awkward moment. And Abraham, what does he say? God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Abraham! How can you trick your son like that? Doesn't he at least deserve the truth at this point? You're planning to tie him and place him upon an altar and plunge a knife into his flesh. How can you live with such a fib on top of everything else that's going on here? Well, of course, we don't know what kind of insight the Lord gave Abraham, but the words that he spoke, they were more true than he knew. Now, it's worth remembering at this point that the Lord has just recently declared Abraham to be a prophet. In fact, the very first prophet of the Bible. And I think there is some prophetic insight here, don't you? The Lord has given him some inkling of something, some flash of insight. And faith in God's promises, his power and his plan, that faith has enabled Abraham to press forward trustingly through this dreadful act of obedience. And it's a remarkable kind of faith that enables him to do that. Now, you and I, we might look at Abraham and say, well, you know, he, he was, of course, a great hero of the faith. Yes, his, his trial and his testing, it was unusually tough, and it, his faithful passage through it, it was remarkable by any standard. And we think about that, and so we reason you know, we can't all be like Abraham, and we probably shouldn't try, and, and it's true enough. I mean, Abraham's role, it was special, and his test, it was unusual. But if we've learned anything from our study of recent chapters in the life of Abraham, it is that Abraham actually was profoundly fallible, and he was remarkably weak, just like me and just like you. And actually, it's worth remembering at this point that our privilege in terms of knowledge of the truth is in many respects much greater than Abraham's privilege. He believed that God would provide the lamb. Somehow, he had prophetic insight to believe that. But he had not met the Savior who would come. He believed that God had life-giving power to overcome the grave but he had not witnessed the resurrection of the Christ. You see, unlike him, you and I today, we look back on the fulfillment of these great promises. We, we look back to Calvary in history and in Scripture, whereas Abraham only looked forward through darkened lenses and in simple hope. We have something, actually, that Abraham did not have. And so, in Abraham, in his faith, I think there is a true model for us, a model for trusting God in trial and enduring through even the hardest test. 
Many of you know I've mentioned this before, that I worked for a while as a school teacher in London while I was finishing off my studies. And one of the responsibilities I took on at the school was leading a, a, a large outdoor expedition program. And for the, the trips we planned, the camping trips, one thing we had to do was fill out these very lengthy and quite tedious risk assessments a, a ahead of the trip. It was a kind of a craze at the time to write risk assessments for every single activity. It, it became a little bit absurd at points. I don't know if it's changed now. Maybe it has. In our age of lawsuits and insurance restrictions and so on, I suppose this kind of thing is a bit inevitable. But as I reflect on the experience of writing those rather dull assessments, I think of Abraham and I think of his test of faith, and it strikes me how very different his outlook was to the risk-averse and cautious outlook of the risk assessment. You know, God says to Abraham, do this, and Abraham says, okay, I will do it. Now, that is faith. That's simple, radical, uncalculating faith. And friends, as I reflect on it, I think that is the only way to live as a Christian. I think it's the only way to walk through testing and to endure under trial. If we're obsessed with avoiding risk and cost, we are going to have a tough time following the Lord wherever He may lead. And so reflecting on that, I just wonder... I wonder where God may be calling you today to tear up the risk assessment, to take him at his word, and to walk with him through darkness, your hand in his. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Lord Who Provides. We have to pause right here, but we're going to get back to this message in just a moment. Well, Jeremy Marshall is a businessman who was diagnosed with cancer a number of years ago. And since being diagnosed with this incurable cancer, he's become known for his ability to connect the difficulties that Christians face in this life with the deep-seated joy that is found in knowing Jesus. And he's written a devotional book about this. It's called Hope in the Face of Suffering. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as you give a financial gift of any amount to Encounter the Truth this month. See, we're a listener-supported broadcast. We're able to stay on this station because of your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount, again, we want to send you a copy of this book, Hope in the Face of Suffering. You can find out more or give online when you come to EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you have just joined us, we're in the book of Genesis, chapter 22. So grab a Bible and meet us there if you haven't already. Back to the message. Here is Jonathan. In a sense now, the focus moves away from Abraham and the faith lessons that he teaches us. The focus now moves to God and the provision that he makes. In times of testing and trial, we look next to God's marvelous provision. The scene has been set. There is tension in the air. We are anticipating a great tragedy. And there's a big part of us that would turn our eyes away. We would avert our gaze at this moment. Abraham is plodding on obediently by faith, but you and I, we are feeling more and more nervous. The thought of the death of a child, the thought that the father might himself sink in the blade and light the match, it is too awful actually to contemplate. The story, it may be familiar, it's a well-known story, but try with me to actually picture the scene and imagine the events unfold. Verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Well, now the tension, it is at the very highest point. The blade is lifted above the boy, the father grasping the handle with, with both hands probably, quivering, no doubt, with this awful sense of expectancy and of grief. And just as Abraham steals himself for the act that would go against every fiber of his humanity and devastate his heart, the angel of the Lord calls out to him from heaven just at that moment, Abraham, Abraham, don't harm the boy. 
Don't do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham, he looks up. And he sees a ram caught in a thicket, and he offers the ram as a burnt offering instead of his son. And in this moment, Abraham sees how the Lord had it all planned out. He sees how the Lord did indeed have an offering prepared. He was proved right in his trust in the Lord, in his prophetic pronouncements of what the Lord would do. And so Abraham, he marked the provision and he marked the occasion by naming the place, verse 14. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. The Lord will provide in the old King James, Jehovah Jireh. And evidently became a saying repeated down through the years, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. We're told at the beginning of the chapter that God sent Abraham to the land of Moriah for this test. The mount upon which the Lord called him to offer his son, the mount on which the Lord made his provision, it was a mount in a place called Moriah. I understand that the scholars identify this as the region where Jerusalem would ultimately be built. It is perhaps this very mount on which the temple was built, the temple where all those animal sacrifices would be given down through the years. It's possible, too, that this mount is another mount just outside the city, perhaps, a mount to which another son of another father carried the wood of his altar of sacrifice, the mount upon which another son was called to die, even perishing at the will of his father. And as we consider all that, as we look at the Lord's choreography of all this, his planning, his powerful symbolism, it, it sends a shiver down the spine. It does, it does for me anyway. I think it's worthwhile just to stand back for a moment and ask, what, what's the bigger significance of this great drama, of this event? Why does God do this? Why does he allow it? As we've seen again and again in the story of Abraham, his own story, the story of his family, it's about so much more than him and it's about so much more than them. They are part of a much grander story of God's plan to redeem a broken world and to bless a lost world ruined through sin. And through his seed, through this line, through the coming of a great descendant to bring salvation, blessings to the world. And this time of testing, this terrible drama, it is about the bigger story of God's salvation plan. The death of a child is an unspeakable thing for any parent to have to endure. I know some listening have actually had to endure that very, that very thing, and I can only begin to imagine the heart-rending agony of that. It's a parent's worst nightmare. It's every parent's worst nightmare. I think it's the cruelest pain that this stricken world can inflict on anyone. I don't think it's possible to imagine worse. And it's quite something that God calls Abraham, the one at the center of his plan to overcome the curse of sin and death in this world. It's quite something that he calls Abraham to face this deepest of trials and this ugliest of agonies, to come very near the actuality of it. But in sparing Abraham the experience in the end, in sparing young Isaac's life, in making a saving provision, the Lord is, I think, saying something very, very wonderful here. He is pointing to something very, very profound. When the Lord Jesus arrives on the scene all those centuries later, John the Baptist famously says of him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here comes the Lamb the promised lamb, the sacrifice, the substitute. That's what John is saying. Jesus comes as the son of the Father, the beloved only son of the Father. At the transfiguration, the Father declares of his beloved son, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. But then as the son nears the place of execution, obedient to the Father's will and not his own, there is no final change of plan. 
No alternative is introduced. And as the son hangs upon the cross, he cries out to the father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God called upon Abraham to enter into the worst trial imaginable in this fallen world, to lose his beloved son, even to be then responsible for his death. But at the final moment, God shows that he will provide a substitute. He will provide the lamb. And at the cross of Calvary, perhaps even at the same location as Abraham's test, God the Father gives his own son to die as the substitute for his beloved children. Jesus enters into the agony and suffering of life in this world. He plums its depth. He pays its price. And he teaches us with a depth of meaning that Abraham just couldn't see in full detail in his day, but saw from a distance. He teaches us that the Lord will provide. He would provide a substitute to die so that none of Abraham's family, none of the family of faith, would ever face ultimate death. He would provide the great sacrifice of sin so that the wreckage of the fall might be undone for those who believe. The Lord would provide. And oh yes, he would show himself to be Jehovah Jireh. I want to go back to this idea of trial. To this theme of testing, I don't think we've left it behind in any of the narrative. I don't think it's incidental to the story just setting the scene, no. I think there's a grand lesson here about the Lord's provision, a, a lesson that speaks to our heart, that touches our heart in times of trial. You see, God called Abraham to face the worst thing anyone could face in this world. He brought him under the most grueling test that anyone could endure. And in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that test, he painted a picture a prophetic picture, a symbol-laden picture of what the Father would do for Abraham and for Isaac and for the entire family of faith. And what's the point? What's the point for those under trial? It is simply this. The God who sometimes sees fit to try us is the same God who entered into the drama in the worst of trials in the person of his son, the God who suffered as a man for us, suffered profoundly and in our place as the man Jesus Christ. And this God, whose ways we will not always understand, he has provided for all that we need at Calvary, and he will provide for all that we need today. You see, He has met you in your need. He's met you in your need for rescue, for forgiveness, for salvation. And the God who made provision for you at the cross, He will not abandon you in your need today. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 22, He who did not spare His own Son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I don't know what trial you're facing today. I don't know what test you may need to endure tomorrow, but I know this. The God who gave his beloved only son for us on the mount of crucifixion he is not a God who stands far off and unmoved. He is truly the Lord who provides, Jehovah Jireh. And if you will trust him in the darkness of testing and of trial, and if you will lean upon his word, you will discover for yourself that he is indeed Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides for his children. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, wrapping up this message, The Lord Who Provides. You know, when we go through some of the trials and struggles of life, that's very often where we see the Lord providing. And Jeremy Marshall has written about this, some of the principles that he has learned about how God has provided and met him in his own struggle of dealing with terminal cancer. He's written a book about that, a devotional book called Hope in the Face of Suffering, We'd love to send you a copy as you give a financial gift of any amount and support Encounter the Truth this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org 
or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Again, EncounterTheTruth.org or 833-99-TRUTH. Thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time.